True from Galilee. A love story by Marjorie Holmes. We are near the end of chapter four in our sixth in the series of readings from an edited version of the book Two from Galilee, published by Fleming H. Ravel Company, written by Marjorie Holmes. It's a fictionalized account of the story between Mary and Joseph, and it brings a lot of the emotion to the situation that we uh, very often miss when we think about Mary and Joseph being together. It also tells us some of their thoughts of God. Again, it's fictionalized, but it's based upon scripture, as you'll see as we get into further readings of the book. Uh, In our last reading, Mary and Joseph, for the first time, had supper together at Mary's parents' house. She got her father to go ask Joseph's father for permission to have him for supper. And Joseph came over, and instead of it turning into a wonderful event, the two men argued politics the entire time, and Mary was disappointed. We now pick up, as the meal has ended, Joseph has left, Mary is now in bed contemplating the whole evening on Two from Galilee. Sleep was a long time claiming her. At first she was too excited by the evening, whose wretchedness in the beginning seemed to enhance its gradually mounting harmony. She lay reenacting it, from the first shattering news of he's here, on through his every gesture, his every word, Joseph's charm with the children, the gentleness of his table manners. The very assertiveness that she had deplored seemed to have won Joachim's respect and the way he'd responded to her mother when the women drew shawls about their shoulders and joined the men on the roof, Mary admired him. But even as Mary lay marveling, the muffled voices came to her from beyond the curtains. She lay stiff, scarcely daring to breathe. Her limbs, aglow a moment before, began to chill. Her parents were quarreling. In whispers that blurred their words, they made them appealing to the impact of those that she heard. No, no, he's not right for her, no matter how pleasant he is. That bright nature, it's like his father's, light, but no substance. That may brighten a window, but it'll never cook a meal. You misjudge him, Hannah. He has a very serious side as well. Didn't you hear our discussion of Israel? He's deeply concerned and has a deep faith. Ha! Deeply concerned? All men are concerned. It's the fashion to be concerned. Small good that does any of us. Let men concern themselves with their wives and children and how to provide for them, especially if they come seeking our daughters in marriage. Our fate as providers depends upon the fate of Israel, when taxes take the very bread from the mouths of our families. No, no, don't think to divert me from Joseph. Like father, like son, he comes from a poor household. But it's a happy household, Hannah. I was there today. I felt their joy. Even the children. Did you feel their ribs? The ribs of Jacob's children are no thinner than those of mine. And there is other food, Hannah. The spirit needs food, too. The food of love. Love? Her voice broke rawly. Accused. You speak as if there is small love in the house that I have made for you. No, no, you're twisting things. I'm only trying to show you that Joseph's background is not so impoverished as you think. Love compensates for many things. And while it's customary and right that parents arrange such matters, how much better for everyone when two people love and and want each other from the very beginning? Think, Hannah, think how much sooner we might have found happiness had it been with us as it is with them, had you loved me from the very start. How do you know? Hannah demanded. Joseph, yes, the way he's hung about her has sickened me for years. But Mary, she's young, she's given little thought to marrying. And if she has, she certainly prefer to do better than this. You're wrong, said Joachim. She loves him so much, she'll have no other man. How do you know? Hannah cried again. She told me. Hannah jerked upright. Told you? I am her mother. Why hasn't she spoken of this to me? She began to sob. Am I then so poor a mother that my own daughter confides such matters to her father's ears instead of mine? Perhaps she felt it would hurt you too much, knowing the high ambitions you have for her. And I'm right. She could have any man in Nazareth. Examine your conscience, Hannah. Is it truly your daughter's happiness that drives you, or only your pride? 
Hannah didn't answer. She'd flung herself back upon the pillow and given herself over to the sobbing that ripped through the curtains, beating upon Mary, who had crept from her own bed, past her sleeping sisters, and now stood at the little window, staring up at the clouds that quilted the sky. Hush, you'll wake the children, Joachim ordered. His voice was stern, to keep at bay the assault upon his senses that her tears always made. Hush now, be still! He patted the heaving shoulders, bony and sharp under the thin shift. One further thing you must consider. Have you thought how it would be should we give Mary to someone like Cleophas? Surely we are far more humble in the sight of Reb Levi than the family of Jacob is to us. Do you think that once Mary and Cleophas were wed, we'd be welcome in their fine house or the homes of their kinsmen? Mary would never consider herself too good for us, said Hannah. As the wife of Cleophas, she'd belong to his family and not ours, and she'd obey him. I've thought about this a long time, Hannah, and even if it weren't for Joseph, I wouldn't give our daughter to anyone as spoiled as Cleophas. We'd lose her, and we'd lose her just as much as if we gave her to Abner. He waited for some reply, but she was too far gone in her grief. His reasons could not penetrate this damp, devastating curtain that she'd thrown up between the two of them. Nonetheless, he drove stubbornly on. If Abner succeeds, as predicted, he'd go to Jerusalem and marry with him. Except for the annual pilgrimages, we'd never see her. Ah, but it was no use. No use trying to talk to her when she became like this. He rose from her side and crept downstairs and outside to the ladder to mount the roof, where his big feet paced up and down, up and down. Mary could hear the dull thudding overhead. She was dazed and shaken. It seemed to her incredible that there should be sorrow and dissension on such a night. It was too beautiful. God's world was simply too beautiful to countenance ugliness and agony, whether it be on the epic scale of Israel's prostration or the sheer stabbing torments of the human heart. And it seemed strangest of all that love could be the cause. Hatred, yes, it was hatred that accounted for the cruelties of Rome. But love, her parents loved her, both of them, just as she loved them. And she loved Joseph, and he loved her. And yet in the strange contortions of human affairs, somehow this mixture of love had given birth to the anguish that now assailed them all. Without realizing it, she still clutched the small towel that Joseph had dropped that night. Now she used it to wipe her wet eyes and pressed it an instant against her mouth. Then she lifted it up in a little gesture of sacrifice. Yahweh, forgive me, she whispered, if it be thy will that I think no more of Joseph. Let me know, and let me be resigned. There was no answer. The stars continued to dance and blaze in a fashion at once friendly and remote. There was naught but the dry rattle of the vines in the breeze, the gentle threshing of the palms and the olive trees beyond. Sometimes when she was very young, she'd felt such an intensity of communion with God. It had seemed to her that she'd actually heard him speak, Mary, Mary. Even at times as if a majestic yet infinitely tender hand had touched her hair and her cheek. Enthralled, eager, innocent, she'd rushed to confide these experiences to Hannah, who only looked dismayed. Don't be deceived, her mother had said. You've got an unusually vivid imagination. See that you learn to discern between that and a dream. Yes, to distinguish the true from the false, to know the actuality from the dream, yet when the first breath one drew in the morning belonged to God, when no morsel was eaten without first asking his blessing, when it was he who ruled not only the universe but the smallest fragment of your life, how was it possible that he did not draw literally close to you at times, flow in and through and around you, making you even more fully one with him, and that he did not move you so deeply and so doing that you felt his almighty hand upon you and heard the impossible voice speak? She could not express it. There were no words to make this mystery plain. But dumbly, blindly, beautifully, the unreasonable conviction remained. Yahweh did love and communicate with his children, perhaps only the very young children who were sufficiently pure and simple to be receptive to his touch, those who were not yet corrupted by the emotions that beset us as we grow older, such as jealousy and worry and selfishness, and the desires that lashed her even now as she stood by the sill, striving for peace. Joseph! Joseph! 
But beyond the whitewashed walls, her mother wept and overheard her father pacing. She longed to be a little child again, untouched by the pains of her womanhood. She longed with a sharp nostalgia for the blessed peace of the presence of God. Thy will be done, she whispered one final time. In this matter of Joseph, let me only obey thee. Chapter 5 Joseph's mother, Timna, had her foot pressed on the treadle. She cocked her white head to hear her son's song, one of the many that had rung through the house since the night that he'd come loping down the hill, his face almost as bright as the torch that had led him home. She and his father, uneasily waiting, had known both relief and dismay at his expression, so plainly did it signal the course that they would now be forced to take. What about the loom? his father asked. Did you fix it? The loom? Joseph laughed, clapping one hand to his brow. <laughs> Nobody mentioned it. I forgot to ask. And how is Hannah? Timna had probed with apprehension. Oh, she's well, and she asked for you. In fact, she was the liveliest of the lot. You were wrong about her mother. All she wants is her daughter's happiness. Ah, now, 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 Jacob protested. He jutted his plump, weak lip. Surely matters aren't suddenly so changed that at Joachim's that they're forced to cast out nets to get men. Timna recoiled at his tactlessness, but Joseph was too elated to take offense at his father. Forced? They wouldn't dare. The nets would break from so many men. He was smiling in triumph. They're just good, humble people, even as we are, who respect their daughter's wishes. After a minute, Joseph said earnestly, Oh, Father, don't make me wait. I know that other Jacob, the one you're named for in the scriptures, had to wait 14 years for his Rachel. But I, I'm afraid I'm not that strong. Forget your fears and your pride and speak to Joachim for me before it's too late. So it seemed that there was no help for it. Though his father had fussed and hedged and put it off for days, in the end, he washed himself and donned fresh clothing and submitted to Timna's trimming of his wild cascade of a beard. Watching that squat figure go trudging off, Timna's breast ached. Compared to many men, he had so little to offer, this dear, sorry husband. She was afraid that he'd be half brash, half apologetic, and try to cover his lacks with a joke. And this would not set well with Mary's parents, for today he would be asking for Mary's hand in marriage. And so we finish there today with just starting chapter 5 as Joseph's father is headed to Mary's house to ask Mary's father for her hand in marriage. We'll find out what happens next time when we listen to more from Marjorie Holmes' book, Two from Galilee.